Hey everyone, I'm Jay. I'm Sophia, and welcome to Witches Betwixt. We are lacking Scott today, he's got a lot to do. Um, so me and Sophia decided to hold down the fort with bringing you guys an episode. Um, today we're going to be talking about Pride Month. It's coming up. Uh, by the time this post, we'll likely be well into Pride Month, which is uh, the month of June. is generally accepted as, uh, as a Gay Pride Month. or I, I kind of hate that it's just called Gay Pride Month, maybe Queer Pride Month. Yeah. But we kind of want to rebrand it a little bit to something like that. Um, and then we're just going to give you guys some personal updates. Sophia's got some big things coming up that she's doing that she wants to share with you. I got some big things that I'm doing. Um, Scott might have some big things, but he's not here. Just kidding. We love him. <laughs> and, um, yes, yeah, so we're just going to update you guys on what we're doing in our kind of, like, personal lives. Then we're going to get into talking about Pride, Pride Month, and how it all intertwines with the queer witch experience. So, um... You want me to start, Sophia, about the stuff that I'm... Yeah, you can go for it. You already seem like you're on a roll. Okay. So, um, so I keep talking I keep talking about this in so many different episodes. I'm moving soon. Um, I'm just not sure which house I'm going to be moving into, because apparently one house, one house is fine, and my sister's going to be moving out of it, um, and she's going to be moving into like, downtown Philly, uh, so me and Joyce might move into that house if it's too much money to fix the one house. There's like a plumbing issue. So I'm a little stressed about that. It's, it's not, they're not far apart. The two houses are like within the same neighborhood, but it's just a matter of like, it's a lot more work to move into one versus the other. And I just really want to get the space like set up already. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just so stressful that, I mean, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I have options and, you know, I'm not, you know, no one's homeless, no one's living on the street in this kind of situation, but it's just a matter of, like, it's stressful to pick up and move, especially Joyce lives in Delaware, so that's far, you know, to move mm-hmm. all of Joyce's stuff, so that's going on, and that's pretty stressful, um, but it's a good thing all at the same time. It's stressful, and it's also good. Um, what really brings up on the stress of it is, like, I'm also planning um, Philly Pagan Pride, and I'm which is betwixt and all these other things and working full time on top of that. So that's, it's a, it's a lot to handle, but it's okay. Um, my name change, there was a little bit of a hiccup with the process. So how it works here, uh, all the states have, there's, there's no uh, national uniform process for changing your name. I don't know if it's similar in Canada per province. It's different. Does each province have their own system? Um, so you have to get your name changed on your uh, birth certificate, and the province that you're born in has to do that. But other than that, the process of changing it is fairly universal from what I understand. Now, that's I don't know everything about it, so that's just yeah. in my experience. But um, Because yeah, you we have also, gone through the process, right? You have really yes. Yeah. yes, but we also don't have to do the thing where we run the newspaper ad for a while. It's literally like... Um, if you're doing name change, it's it's fairly simple. If you're doing name and gender marker change, then you basically need, like, a doctor to sign to say that, yep, yeah, it's legit, which is usually uh, fairly chill if you have a good uh, trans-friendly doctor. I was very lucky to have a good doctor um, at the Three Bridges Clinic in Vancouver, so I'm very much grateful for that. She helped me out a lot with that. But, yeah, it's, it's not a hard process. It's just, like, getting all the documentation up. And, like, if you're low income, you can prove that you're low income to have them waive the fees, which is really nice. Yeah. It's actually it's actually a little bit similar here to, to what you were describing. So um, I guess I can get into the process a little bit for anyone who might be interested. So in Pennsylvania, what you have to do is um, either go to a lawyer or a law clinic. In this case, I'm going to a law clinic because I'm – I'm low income, um, especially at the time that I submitted my application. I make a little bit more money now, but not significantly. So, so at the time, so as I show, I showed proof of my income, and they said, "Okay, you're broke. Great, we'll take on your case." So, um, what I had to do, the only thing that I had to actually pay out of pocket was two hundred and four dollars. I wrote up a money order, and that is for the publication cost. So we had to run. Um, they have to run an ad for a couple of weeks, or a notice. I shouldn't say an ad, but it's like a notice in like the in like the line ad section of the new of um of two newspapers. One is the Legal Intelligencer, and the other one is the Philadelphia Gay News. So you run, 
a little so and so is changing their name to blah and their court date is blah is basically what it says um i think that's a bit bizarre i yeah. think it's really odd and i also think it's a little dangerous because it's like it you're is. really hella outing that person especially yeah. like if people are looking for it you know what i mean like or yeah. what if you just stumble across it you know what i'm saying it's just it's very it's very weird yeah, and, like, people can be fleeing from, uh, like, abusive family or other people, and it literally puts them at risk to have to do that, you know? Um, like, the whole idea behind it, I heard, was that, like, if someone's looking for you, like, maybe you did something shifty or you're running away from, like, child care, you can't right. get away from it. But it's, like, your original name is still kept on record with your name change certificate anyways, so it seems like it's just... A, a barbaric step in the process. Yeah, it seems very. It seems like very ancient history the way mm -hmm. the way that they make you do that. Because I'm because in my case I'm like all right, well no one's in, like I'm not running away from anything. No one that I know of is after me about anything. But mm -hmm. could you like could you imagine if like I had like an abuser or a stalker or or something you know of that nature and. I just, I just think that's a bit outrageous. But anyway, so it's two hundred four dollars for them to publicly announce what the hell I'm doing, right? Um, I still want to get a copy of the paper that it's going to be in because, well, I mean, I paid for it, right? I might as well cut out a <laughs> clipping of it, <laughs> so yeah. I'll just keep it in my little memory book. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I'm going to do that. Uh, originally, the court hearing was supposed to be May sixth, and it got pushed back. Something about processing my payment for the publication. I don't know, whatever. But the um, Temple Law Clinic has been updating me about what's going on, so that's fine. I'm hoping that by maybe the end of the summer, it all goes through, or like maybe well into like the fall, like it's all settled and done, because that only changes my name, because then I have to take those decrees and go to Social Security and yep. change it on my Social Security card and my birth certificate. And then I have to go to the DMV to change my gender marker. Yeah. So, yes, my name will be Jason, but it'll still say female until I, get, until I go to the DMV with a bunch of documents, uh, the decree from the court, my new birth certificate, however the fuck long that's going to take to get to me. And then I have yeah. to go to the DMV with a letter from a therapist or doctor and say, hey, this person's not nuts, they've changed, you know, whatever. And then say, here, change my shit. And the DMV is just notoriously annoying <laughs> to deal with. You wait there for hours just for them to tell you, oh, you actually need this form. Go back in line. Uh, and wait, yeah. oh, it's, it's fucking brutal. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be patient, try as best as I can. But the reason I'm really hoping this can like go through faster is because a friend of mine wants to go to this this furry convention out in illinois hell yeah in december but <laughs> in P in america we are so fucked up so each state has their own ids right mm -hmm. has their own so a delaware license a delaware id looks different from a pa id or a jersey id or whatever the case is so they all look different they're all the same but they look different so, Pennsylvania, for some reason, is not on this real ID system of whatever that means. It's this system called real ID. To board a plane, even domestically, you need a real ID or a passport. I have oh, need. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Uh-huh. Thankfully, this doesn't take effect until October 2020, and I, wanted to, and I want to fly out in December 2019. But I just have a hunch that I'm still going to get screwed. Mm -hmm. So I'm really hoping that my name change shit goes through really quick so I can either, one, get a real ID with my correct name because I'm running into the problem now where I show my ID that has my current legal name and my female gender marker and people go, what? And I'm yep. like, it's me. <laughs> Just, uh, it's awkward. Hi, here you go, <laughs> you know. Traveling while trans is a fucking ordeal. I'm telling you, like, I haven't even, like, I haven't even actually done it yet. But I'm not looking forward to it. Because I've heard horror stories of, like, trans men, like, like 
uh, like packing or something like that, you know what Ugh. I mean? Like having like wearing a packer and then like going through security and they're like literally like take your dick out of your pants. Like it's just it's, it's insane. Ugh. It's so yeah. degrading. So degrading. But anyway, so I'm hoping that I can either get a real ID or my passport by December. But I want my legal name change to go through first. So I'm like really fingers crossed and like down to the wire. I'm gonna buy my airfare next paycheck so in like two weeks from now and i'm just gonna uh, hope that it all works out because you're just, oh man because you can't wait too long to buy airfare you know what i mean because the prices just go up the closer to the date so it's just a little stressed <laughs> just a little yeah stressed. <laughs> and like if the name change doesn't go through in time um i know that even here they won't let you fly unless you have id that matches your ticket name unless you like go in and buy the ticket that day if they had something available perhaps but even then yeah you'd have to and that's the other ID. thing i'm thinking about so i'm like i'm just gonna hold on to my old id Smart. the one that i have now and when i eventually get changed so i can present it with like three different ids and be like this used to be me now it's me here you know what i mean so That's, yeah it's just but i'm curious like if i buy the tickets now and suppose everything goes through by let's say september if i'm lucky mm -hmm. right i wonder if i could call the airline and say hey if i can show you proof of my change of name can you reprint me can you reissue my boarding pass with the correct name i don't know maybe i don't know if, sometimes i feel like if you ask nicely people Sometimes. Depends on the person that you get to. It if really, it really depends. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, travel, traveling while trans, I feel like it could be a book, like a like a book, you know, like a guidebook. <laughs> traveling. Oh my god, like a fucking textbook almost for how much you need to know. Uh huh. <sighs> Which actually is a great segue into what you're doing because you are trans and you're going to be traveling overseas. Yeah, so um, y'all might have heard me mention that I have my voice surgery coming up at the Zon Voice Center in Seoul, South Korea. Um, I depart this Saturday, and we're recording on Sunday, so I approximately have six days before I fly out. So um, if I get a chance to have um, <clears throat> an episode that we record with Scott, these will be the last episodes that you get to hear me with this voice. Um, because everything's going to be changing, but I can't stop stressing about it. I literally, um, thanks PTSD, uh, <laughs> I get nightmares all the time or stress dreams and they don't even have to be reasonable. Right. But like, I've been stressing nonstop about this. Like, what if they like give me issues at the airport because I'm trans and then I miss my flight and I miss my surgery, you know, or stuff like that. Or like, anything or like what happens when I get there you know because um on June 4th I get my surgery done and I can't speak uh for about six weeks I I'm not even supposed to say more than two words a day um so it's going to be really interesting being in a country where I don't speak or write the language there and not being able to even speak English and I'm gonna have to like bring a notepad along with me and write stuff out in English and hopefully that works well enough, you know, but I'm like It's South Korea, so I feel like they're pretty good. Maybe you, you, you From, could get by. I mean, um, it's, I'm not nearly the first trans person to come there for voice surgery out of country. I, it's not, uh, I, I'm pretty sure they'll be like, oh yeah, you had a Zon center, like this is a fairly common experience, right? So I'm not that worried. Um, what I'm really stressing more about is I can't be late as a Virgo. It's like the antithesis of my existence. And I always worry that like, if you're late, it won't happen. They won't take you in and do the surgery thing. And um, trying to navigate uh, transit on a, a, a city that you've never been to in a language you don't speak is really stress inducing, you know? So luckily the person I'm staying with is like, two kilometers away from the Zonvoy Center, and it should be a fairly easy route to get there and back, but we'll see. I have no idea what I'm in for. So um, are you staying with someone that you know? Yeah. Oh, so you so, do know someone. Well, I met a... It's very serendipitous, actually. Like, almost yeah. like magic just kind of went into it. <laughs> but um, I know a guy, I'm not going to give his full name out, but his name is Malcolm who I met last summer at a nice barbecue with one of my friends who has also moved away. And he went through a breakup and then 
just decided in like a bold move, fuck it, I'm going to South Korea and I'm going to teach English for a while because he got that opportunity. So he's already been there for a while. He's already got a place that's actually remarkably close to the Yizan Voice Center. Mm. And he's offered for me to stay with him, which is like amazing because I have to be in from the second and I have to leave on the 11th. So it's like 10 days I'm going to be in South Korea for, which is like a week and a half sort of deal. And that would be a lot of fucking money uh, for a hotel. hotel. And I don't even have a credit card, so they wouldn't even like, I wouldn't be able to book that. So there's almost no way this could have happened unless he just happened to be there, which he did sort of thing. So I, it's like the, the stars are aligning and everything's like, working out so that this is actually going to happen and i've been putting a lot of magic into it and making sigils and giving offerings to the spirits out back saying hey please help this go smoothly i need your help um but yeah so your surgery is the fourth the fourth what, yes. what day are you flying out What's, what's Saturday? my itinerary. I fly out on Saturday. Um, I have to be at the airport like three hours ahead of time because it's the way that international flights work, apparently. Oh, um, yeah. I yes, fly definitely. for 13 hours nonstop. Oh, well, so you got a nonstop flight? That's crazy. Luckily, yeah. yeah. But it's like three hours in wait just to like leave, then 13 hours in flight. And then I get to South Korea. My friend's picking me up there on the 2nd. Oh, Saturday's Um, the 1st. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I leave at, like, (sighs) noon our time, and I arrive at 7 p.m. their time because of, like, the time difference and the flight time as well. So (laughs) it's it's crazy long. You're going to be jet lagged as shit. Oh, I'm just going to have to, like, be popping caffeine pills or something. I'll make it work. I'm, I'm a trooper. I've been through tough shit before. And um, I have my consultation on the 3rd, which is where they, like, check in. They, like, I think do an ultrasound of my voice, or not my voice, my throat, to assess whether or not I um, need a Botox injection to support where they're going to be doing the surgery on, because it can cause, like, certain issues if, if you whatever i'm not a doctor so what does the botox do it just like i tightens don't something i don't shrink. fucking know to be really honest I, well, I mean it is a reputable surgery center that you're going mm-hmm. to so yeah and like i looked up stuff online for this and literally everybody who posted about it on reddit said it was like one of the best decisions they've ever made for themselves with doing something so they're a good reputable center and i trust them um i'm also going to be doing a video for them because they have this um kind of promotional thing where if you let them take photos of you uh before your surgery you can uh you'll get a hundred dollars back from your surgery cost and this is all in usd so it's like a hundred and like 135 dollars yeah, it's a come up for you but if i record a video for them um after my voice is recovered several months later they'll send me four hundred dollars back so that's a pretty big chunk of money and i'm happy yeah, that's a nice chunk that. So you'll probably see me um, in my post-recovery voice as well on the Zon Voice Center uh, YouTube page, unless that falls through. I don't know. I, I think don't it's like going it. to be like, like I'm excited, but I think it's going to be like kind of, kind of weird, maybe a little jarring. It's going to be uncanny voice yeah. because I guess it's different for like for like me, right? I started taking tea, but it was a very gradual mm-hmm. drop. Like this is just going to be like, oh, Sophia sounds like this now, and so like, well. Whoa. So here's how it works, actually. Um, Is it gradually, gradually like, like raise and pitch? It, no? It's a one-time procedure, and it'll my voice will jump up a lot. And as um, I'll be like high and squeaky for a little bit, but as my voice recovers, it'll settle down into a more smooth. Uh, so it starts high and then works a little bit lower until like it's right where it's gonna be, and then I get comfortable in it and I learn how to work with it, and that's that. So. It it is a process that takes place over several months, but it is a very sudden change. Yeah, I, I just I never I never I never noticed how vocal cords work until mine started changing. I guess because I realized like I used to be able to sing, not I'm not a professional singer, but I used to be able to sing like pretty decently, like I could hold a tune, and I and I was in choir like as a kid and stuff like that, but I would. I started out singing soprano like when I was very very young, and then I kind of shifted to to alto in my like older years. But I could still sing pretty high. I could never sing very low, 
and now I, I try, obviously I try and sing those high notes. I can't imagine hitting those high notes now. Um, but what's interesting is I'm, I'm starting to try to teach myself when no one's around, obviously, because it sounds terrible right now, um, is trying to teach myself how to sing like all over again. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's interesting because my, my singing voice, I always felt came from my, came from my throat. I guess it's the best way I can describe it to hit high notes. But now I feel like my, my singing voice, even my speaking voice, it comes from my chest. Yep. That's where I feel it come from. And it's so it's so interesting that like to, to feel that change and to feel that difference. I'm, I'm curious like how that's going to feel for you. Like Right now, do you feel like your voice still comes from your chest or do you feel like it comes from your, from your throat? So that's actually a little bit of an interesting thing. Um, I do kind of play around with voice acting a little bit because I do Dungeons and Dragons. So like, you know, I can do Lawrence, who's like a real low voice right here. Or, yeah, and like I've heard like, you I drop your that. voice before, and I was like, yeah. oh, that's cool. But I've heard you also, you know, like you, you keep it like when you speak, it's at like a higher pitch. Or like I could go, hey, it's Sophia. Even though I feel like putting on that falsetto makes me feel a little uncomfortable with myself. Um, but right now it comes basically from mid throat, right, like right, right here. Um, yeah. And that's just from, like, learning to raise my pitch through just transition and talking. Because, like, I used to kind of talk like this a lot more. And I had to, like, put on that idea of, like, hey, yo, I'm a tough guy. I got this low right. voice over here. But, like, that's not what you're used to hearing from me because I've, like, done a gradual shift, right? So it's weird. Um, I can make my voice kind of jump all over the place and I have no idea where it's going to sit. It might go all the way up into my nose and I might be like, hey, I'm Sophia. I'm a <laughs> Girl. <laughs> you sound like a like an anime character or something. <laughs> something to that effect yeah there you go that'd be great for your voice acting career it'd be perfect then you just have to learn how to speak fluent japanese and you're set <laughs> well i mean to be honest most voice actors would do uh dubs because i'm that's true I, yeah i'm a super nerd and i'm really into critical role um so i've listened to all of them talk about it and a lot of them do anime dubs and that's like a large part of what they do for their work I'm very grateful to people who do anime dubs, and I'm sure anyone who's listening to this who's an anime fan is going to be like, what you're about to say is sacrilege, and I'm going to unsubscribe from this podcast, <laughs> but I prefer dubbed anime. There, I said it. I can reason say... Being is because I'm often watching it while I'm doing something else. Okay. So I look back, you know, like, so instead of like, because I, sometimes I just listen more than I'm actually watching... So to so English helps me in that regard, you know. So yeah, um, it's very much like when you're watching anime with subs, it needs your undivided attention. Exactly. But like that said, there's a few classics that I can't watch in subs. I need the English dub. Like Sailor if I were to go back and watch Cowboy Bebop, well, actually, I'm not a Sailor Moon girl. I never grew I up and watching were. that. I'm a Card Captors girl. Oh, Card that's Captors right. Card Captors. Yeah. And the uh, Japanese subs in that is actually really good because the four kids version scrubbed out all queerness in the series and like her brother's canonically gay in the Japanese yeah. one, you know. Same with like Yu-Gi-Oh. So, I grew up watching oh uh, yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh, the four kids version though, you know. <laughs> so were mm -hmm. they apparently Yu-Gi-Oh was a lot is a lot darker than uh than we know. Apparently like they don't go to the Shadow Realm, like they actually die in the Japanese they get version. Murdered. <laughs> yeah, they get brutally murderized. So <laughs> Yeah, but, like, I couldn't imagine listening to Cowboy Bebop in subs, and I've listened to it, and I'm just like, this isn't Spike, you know? Uh, yeah. It's not it's not what I grew up with. And the same thing goes for, like, maybe uh, most of the Toonami runs, you know, like Outlaw Star and Dragon Ball Z and maybe a little bit of Gundam Wing, you know? Except Gundam Wing is very good with its subs from what I did watch a little bit. Because you associate those voices with those characters. It's not the same. 100%, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It's going to be just so interesting when you, you know you start you start speaking again and your voice is totally different. And I'm gonna be like, is that is that you? I'm it's gonna actually, be a fucking ordeal. Uh, you're gonna get on like uh, like the the gaming like the PS4 group and they're gonna be like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. God, and I'm not looking forward to having to like explain myself with vague hand gestures for like six weeks and maybe a voice modulator on my phone or a notebook. Like oh, have a dry erase board around my neck with a just like learn to write upside down and show people. You actually, know? that might be a cool idea or just find a way to like flip it over real quick. Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, the good thing, you're actually in kind of like 
it's like a it's a bittersweet I guess sort of situation. The fact that you're not um, you're not full time employed right now, so you don't have a job that you have to report to every day. Could you imagine yeah. trying to like work and not talk? I don't know uh, if it could happen. I Depends. could actually because I I very much hate talking to people at work sometimes. Um, well, I guess that you're on the job in the kitchen, you be all right. You have to – okay, so the, the, the 50-50 thing about the kitchen is I could do prep work and be fine. I'd yeah, never have to things. say a word to anyone, and yeah. I'm very careful about knives. I've never cut anybody else with it ever. You know, yeah. I'm like sword fighter, so you know how to like walk around with a fucking half a foot blades, nothing compared to a four foot long one, right? So – I could work in the back of house and do prep work and be perfectly fine, but I would never be able to work on service because there's no way when you're working in a kitchen that's very small that has like two deep fryers and a grill and all this stuff and like less than three feet of width for walking room, you need to call out behind somebody every single time or you're going to get burnt or stabbed and there's yeah. just nothing you can do about it. So if I was working, um, I could still have good supplemental income, but because I'm laid off, um, I'm going to rely on hopefully EI not cutting me off because it's been a hot minute that I've been on it for. Um, I might be hung out uh, to dry financially for the summer. So I might make some risky financial decisions, which uh, you'll hear about later, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess it's just, it's just cool. It's just cool that you're, that you're going to do this. I've never heard of, anyone i've never heard of this before i've never heard of a surgery that can that can change your voice yeah so how do you I'm, feel about I, how do you feel about traveling though do you feel what what has you more stressed the travel or the surgery probably the travel um i'm not worried about the surgery and the recovery i'm more worried about whether or not they're going to harass me for being trans and like i'm very lucky that i have my name legally changed and my gender marker legally changed so there's none of that bullshit but yeah, like, like your paperwork, sometimes your paperwork. yeah but they like sometimes walk you through shitty body scanners and i'm sure there's like thousands of stories of trans people being like violated at security airports online simply because we're trans and they can do whatever they want because security theater is a bunch of bullshit. And the more that you humiliate people who are vulnerable, the more, I guess it makes people who aren't vulnerable comfortable. I guess that's how it works. Kind of like taking off it's, your shoes doesn't really help security, but they make you do it anyways. Yeah. I, I've always, I've always, always, always gotten nervous walking through security, even before, even before coming out, even before anything, I just, I don't know. You know, like, some people are, like, afraid of doctors. You know, like, doctors yeah. and dentists just make them, like, just generally nervous and anxious. And that's how I've always felt about security. And I think it's it's always, be especially metal detectors, always bothered me because I always had a lot of piercings. And mm -hmm. I always, like, especially in my younger days, I always had, like, a chain wallet and, like, a belt, like, a studded belt and stuff like that. So I always had metal. And I was, oh, yeah, right, my belt. Oh, yeah, this. And, the, and then they did, they they start to get pissed off at you like what else do you have on you and they start to like really like you yeah know, get on you and it always made me so nervous just to just to go through security and it still does and like now that i'm thinking about you know just flying to this flying even domestically like you're flying internationally and that's like a whole other it's a whole other ball game but like even i'm just thinking about flying domestically and i'm, and I'm trying to like stay positive about it but i'm also like nervous as fuck i'm like i haven't dealt with right airline security post 9-11 in this country i haven't dealt with that um yeah as a trans person so i just i don't know it's, um, honestly i'm more worried for you flying within your own country than me flying to seoul because really? i haven't well i mean like my documentation's already lined up um yeah and yeah, mine, re mine re relies on a lot of factors yeah <laughs> lining up. canada and South Korea aren't like necessarily super transphobic countries to be to be in. America scares the shit out of me. Like they they will do anything that they feel like they can do to exercise their own power. And you know, man, I'm I'm, I'm more worried about you flying than me. Yeah, I'm hoping it'll be okay because I'm flying out of Philly, which is fairly okay to live in, in where I do. So I'm flying out of Philly. Layover in Boston, which isn't mm -hmm. too terrible. They're pretty progressive out there. And then going into um, 
from Chicago, actually, not far from where Ava is. Oh, shit. Yeah, which is why we're, we're trying to drag Katie with us, too. So, because oh, <laughs> <laughs> I figured that'd be fun. Um, but yeah, so, I don't know, it's, so I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it goes over fine, but... I- I'll I'll send some magic your way. It depends <laughs> to help those things smooth out. Yeah, definitely. But actually, I mean, I think we can kind of get into the idea of the, the pride conversation now that we're talking about yeah. um, the, the trials and tribulations of traveling while trans, which Ooh. I feel like should be the title of a memoir of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> or a textbook on how to survive it. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about pride. Uh, we may have we may have touched on this in, in an earlier episode or an older episode. I can't remember if we ever actually talked about Pride, Pride Month, what it means to us. Um, I can't remember, but I feel like every year we'll probably talk about it in some regard because it comes around. Yeah. It's it's incredibly important to talk about. So a lot of people that I encounter, uh, I've been I've been encountering this a lot lately, um, especially with with Pride coming up is. I'm just going to say the first thing that I hear that always pisses me off, and they say to me, what about, well, I, you know, you have gay pride, you have trans pride, you have um, black pride, Latino pride, uh, Asian American pride. So you have all these different ideas of, of pride and, and taking yeah. um, pride in who you are and where you come from, and then people say to me, well, what about straight pride? I what knew about, that's where you were going. What about straight pride or what about white pride? Ah. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> a moment of silence. Or... White pride is absolute <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> that yeah. The fuck. Coming to you from two white people. Um, white pride is nonsense. Um, so everyone can shut up about that. Irish American pride. Have your Polish American pride. Fine. Yeah, I know. Like generally, they're all white people, but just there is no white culture is not a thing. You know what I mean? It's just a, it's a, it's a skin tone. Yeah. Also, one thing I'd like to point out, um, I've kind of started to be a little bit more vocal about this because I've had to keep it quiet for a long time. But I'm like Métis on my dad's side, so I'm not 100% white. Um, yeah, you're so native, right? Yeah, Métis is um, basically people who are colonized, uh, who are indigenous, and being the descendants of them. So granted, that means that I'm going to have a lot of white in me, but I also am descendant of Cree people who lived in uh, northern Quebec. And that's actually where my last name even comes from. Montanai was like um, a subgroup of Innu who were colonized by the French people, and that was their word for them. So when they colonized them, they gave them the last name, the Montagne. So I'm not the whitest person in the world, definitely yeah. not. Um, yeah, not. And- yeah, that, that's definitely interesting that you point that out because that, that's also important too. So, you know, because like just because people look white, they do also have heritage. You know what I'm saying? But like, for someone. I only look white if I'm not getting the sun, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, man. I, I don't know. I feel like, um, like tomato should be like a race of people because <laughs> I just turn into a tomato like <laughs> when the sun hits me. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so those are the two things I keep encountering, straight pride and white pride. Um, I think we've just flat out said here on this podcast our stance is white pride is nonsense, it's bullshit, and stop talking it's about racist. it. Yeah. Um, it's racist and just everyone needs to calm the fuck down. Um, the second thing, straight pride. So I tried to I tried to think – I tried to put myself in the perspective of someone who is – um, I guess, cis and heteronormative in every aspect, right? Mm-hmm. So I tried to put myself in, in that mindset of, <clears throat> okay, so um, a, a cis, hetero cis male is at um, a, a gay pride event. I would imagine that maybe he might feel a bit out of place because mm-hmm. that's just, it's not, it's not the norm for someone like that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he is the outcast. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So the way that I view Pride events is that it's a it's a gathering of the minority. It's the one day in which the minority is the majority. Mm-hmm. And it's important to have that gathering, to have that collective consciousness present. 
I think pride events are important. And to say that there should be a straight flag, which apparently there is, I don't know. <laughs> what is it? Just a white sheet of paper with a fucking. I, I don't know. I think it's like black and white or something like that. <laughs> I have no idea because this actually came up. Um, Joyce's uh, stepmom was here, was in this apartment like some time ago, and me and Joyce were talking about like hanging like a rainbow or like a trans flag or something like that somewhere around, and uh, their stepmom was like, "Oh, but what about like." a normal people flag. And it was like, <laughs> normal people flag, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if she quite knew what she was saying. I really don't know. I don't know. It, it was just, it was a bizarre moment where we were like, get the fuck out. You know, <laughs> there's just, the door. There's the door. <laughs> Go. Ski daddle. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, you reach that point where you're like, just stop talking. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I will <laughs> gag you with my ball gag and kick your ass out the door. Um, but there were kids here, so we were like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, well, that's just not a thing, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think I would also like to say that straight pride is not a thing, and I would venture to say that you would, you would agree I would say that straight pride is every day that they don't have to face discrimination, every day that they get to go to a job and no one looks at them sideways, any day that they get to take transit and they don't have to worry about someone shooting them daggers because they're holding their girlfriend's hand, any day that they don't get misgendered when they go through a drive through or any other position. You get your straight pride and you get your cis pride, and it's every month and every day of the fucking year, and they just don't like not having everything be about them. Um, a good reference to this is is uh, when International Women's Day comes up, there's always guys being like, why is there no International Men's Day? And then there's a swath of women who come up and say, actually, there is, you fucking idiot. Google it. And it's like sometime in autumn. And it like... Uh, International Men's Day is most Googled on International Women's Day because when people who are privileged and have all the space in the world see somebody else get the spotlight, it upsets them because they don't they don't have to deal with that constantly. And they're used to their narrative being the only one that they see. And that upsets them because they can't pass the torch for a fucking 30 day period without needing to cause a stink. And I just think it's um, entitlement at its absolute finest. You know, I would agree. Um, so it, what's kind of interesting for me is that um, part of, I guess, some of the the weirdness that comes with transition from female to male is sort of leaving traditionally female uh, a traditionally female space into a male space. Mm-hmm. So male spaces are weird. Yeah. They're weird, um, especially because like at work, some dude will say something kind of misogynistic, and they're like, yeah, "All right, Jay," and I'm like, "I disagree." You know what I mean? Like I can, I I will just flat out, I'll be like, "I disagree with what you're saying. That's fucked up. Mm-hmm. Let's move on." Um, and I think that has kind of brought me some side eyes from people. Um, but I don't really care because I feel like as trans men, we are in a unique position to champion for women because we were once Definitely. perceived as women. Um, and s- which kind of leads me into the idea of, of, of pride in that when I, I'll say identified, even though it's really, a, I identified as a woman because I didn't know what else was going on. I guess that's the the best way to put it. I didn't have language or vocabulary for what I actually felt. So when I identified as a butch lesbian and I lived my life as a butch lesbian, um, which was probably from the point that I was 17 up until uh, three or four years ago. So I was like 25, 26, 24, something like that, between 24 and 26. Um, Yeah, so... It is a lot different. It's a lot different from when I was a lesbian, quote unquote, to being trans. Um, so when I was a lesbian, I felt incredibly welcome at Pride events. You know, I was like, oh, cool, like, there's all these women here and they're butch and that's okay and, and that makes me feel kind of okay. Um, and, you know, and it was it was nice to see that representation and all these you know, people were coming up to me like, yeah, dyke pride and dyke power and 
and I felt very, I felt empowered at Pride events or at like Outfest or any kind of queer related event. And then um, as I started to transition, I realized that in those traditionally lesbian spaces, a lot of them felt like trans men were lesbians who had lost their way. I've heard that turfy bullshit, yeah. Yes, I didn't even know what turf was until like maybe eight months ago. I I just didn't really understand what that meant. And I was like, oh, wow. So like now that I've actually figured myself out, so instead of someone being like, hey, I'm really glad you figured your shit out and you're living your truth and you're doing your thing. Instead, it was just like, oh, you're a man now, so you're not welcome here. You're a man, so therefore... All of the all of the male privilege is you instantly have it, and I'm like, well, no, that's really not the case. But no, I just feel like whenever I whenever I speak in a I guess a traditional women's uh, place, I get shot down. Yeah. And when I speak in a male traditional place, I also get shot down because I defend women. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a double edged sword. And now I and I understand why a lot of trans men just kind of like, oh yeah, you know that chick's real hot. Like I'd fuck her. I get why they do that now. It's to blend, yeah. to blend, and it's fucked up. I don't agree with it, but I understand where it comes from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had similar experiences. Like um, pre-transition, I went to a pride in 2008 back in Nelson, BC. Um, and like I've always had uh, white privilege, you know, so. Pride has always been more generous to me than it will be for people who are visibly not. And, like, when everybody just thought that I was a bisexual cross-dresser, when really I'm not even interested in men, honestly, but everybody perceived me as bisexual because, like, I was openly billing myself as a cross-dresser at the time because it was the closest language I felt comfortable associating myself with. Um, The space was incredibly welcoming. Like, it was it it was like the event was here for you, you know, yeah. and um, it was weird because uh, coming out as a trans woman and going to Pride, you absolutely feel like you're just the tacked on T at the end of the LGB, you know, and um, depending on how you look, even people will completely judge you. Like I don't necessarily get um, a side glance when I'm walking in the dike march, but if I speak up, people sure as fuck look at me because my voice out like very clearly is trans. So um, it's a really mixed experience. I've had um, certain pride experiences were very good for me. Like when I was one of the organizers of the uh, Vancouver trans march back in, I forget the year it was like 2014 or some shit. Um, Wait, no. No, it was 2017, sorry. Um, That was good because that's a protest march. And for me, Pride um, is a bit of a celebration, yes, but it's also hugely a protest against, like, what we go through in the world. And Pride started as a riot at Stonewall, as I'm sure a lot of people know, with Marsha P. P. Johnson chucking that brick in that cop's face because they were tired of of everybody getting arrested. A lot yeah, of exactly. don't know that now. A lot of younger people don't know that. And granted, yeah. that that wasn't even our generation. That wasn't our time either. Mar- like Marsha P. Johnson. Way that earlier. Whole, yeah, it was way earlier than us. And there's even yeah. people in our age group that are not aware of that pride was originally almost like a it was a battle. It was a riot. It was started by a black trans woman because um, the cops would keep raiding uh, pri- or gay bars because then they could get bribes to be left alone. So, of course, you know, the white cis gays are going to be able to bribe the cops and be left alone nine times out of ten. But if you're a trans woman of color, you are not going to get any type of, like, n- niceness at all from a cop. So she got tired of it and she chucked a fucking brick right into a cop's face. And that's what started pride. And it was a riot and they fought for like days. I don't even know how long it actually went for, but that's what actually happened. And pride's been kind of declawed since then. It's become like, Oh look, it's a party space. Please don't be upset with us for the fact that we dehumanize you constantly. And it's like, got rainbow capitalism tied in where like bank of montreal comes in and sponsors you and gives the pride community x amount of dollars and look at how good we are but we don't actually care about what you're going through and it's just another avenue for us to market you could still be fired for being gay if you work at one of our branches or you can still be fired for being trans or working one of our branches yeah it's it's literally 
And it's literally just another way to profiteer off of a group's uh, movement for resilience and survival, because that's what Pride started as. It wasn't a celebration. It was a fuck you. We're here and we're alive and we're queer and you're going to fucking deal with it sort of thing. And like with like things going on with the Trump administration and how our world is right now. I feel like pride is definitely going to start taking a step that way because there's like a lot of um, like cis straight people who go to pride. And like, I'm not saying like, cause there's a lot of uh, letters for the LGBT community, including like asexual, aromantic people. And exactly. if you're not within like the main cis straight heteronormative, complete cut and file, what society expects you to be pride has a place for you and you're welcome there. But there's also a lot of people who aren't, who come there to party it up because it's the coolest thing. And Skrillex is on stage there. Got to get those tickets. Right. And it becomes like a thing where our very, um, our very struggle for freedom and existence has been appropriated Race. and turned into a fucking party for people who have no stake in our survival anymore. And I think it's high time that people remembered that we are still dealing with this shit and we are still getting killed. There are still trans people every fucking month getting murdered ridiculously, brutally. And we don't have space to constantly put up with everybody like brushing that under the rug and expecting us to be okay with it because absolute vodka is on sale and it's rainbow fucking colored on the bottle, you know? Exactly. So yeah. like, yeah, I have mixed feelings about pride very heavily. Yeah. And I think, it, I think it really comes down to, it's just, it's when, it's when I transitioned, it's when I said, well, this is my identity now. And that's when I really started to feel like I start, cause at being gay. Okay. I know people still get shit for being gay in mm -hmm. society, they do, but not as much shit as trans people get for just existing. Yeah. Right. So I'm not saying one struggles. I'm not trying to, like, say whose life is harder. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that I've realized I've encountered more backlash for being trans than I ever did for just being gay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even still, my own father just can't... He can't get. He just. He just throws my birth name out there. My mom is at least trying. She fucks up on the pronouns, which I'm like, I don't even care about that. Just use the damn name, <laughs> and she does, and I, I yeah. commend her for that. Um, so it, it's just a lot harder. Being it's a lot harder being trans than it is just being gay. Mm -hmm. That's. I'm just gonna. I, I think I would say that that's true nearly everywhere. Yep. And it's harder if you're both, too, because a lot of us are, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are, because most trans people are queer in, in some of that, or they just view being trans as, as queerness. Um, so that, I, I really do struggle with the rainbow capitalism part. Me and Joyce went to Pride, um, this, this past Pride. And in Philly, I, I, when I was a teenager and I went to Philly Pride, it was... One, it's always hot because it's summer, so everyone wears next to nothing, um, except me, because I was always, I've always been bigger and very um, conscious mm -hmm. about my body, so I would sweat my ass off, <laughs> like, wearing <Which>? clothes. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so, Philly Pride is, there's a parade, they, they shut down some of, uh, like, our center city, old city area, there's a parade, and the parade is very, like, it's floats of different bars, banks, uh, cell phone carriers, different businesses and bars. The bars are always, they're the gay bars in the area, and they're full of scantily clad men shaking their asses. Okay, it's eye candy, I guess. Congratulations, you're pretty and nice to look at. Okay, keep going. Um, and, you know, throwing throw colored beads like it's Mardi Gras. Yep. and the, the rainbow bead necklace and so just watching all these things go by but none of it feels real so like as a teenager yeah. i was like this is cool and everyone's gay and everyone's super happy about being gay Ooh. and then as a trans person and also i'm older too so i'm seeing this through like a more mature lens i was like where are the people like me yeah where are they I don't see them. I see very beautiful, you know, cis gay men. I just, where are the trans men? Where are the trans women? Where are you? 
Why are you not in this parade? Why don't I see you? Um, and so that was something I realized. And then now with everything with Trump and just how everything feels, it we're, we're going backwards in a lot of things. Um, it feels definitely more terrifying to to be out in any capacity now in America because all of the racists and homophobes and transphobes now have a platform. Yeah. Um, they have a champion. They have someone sitting on the fucking throne to say, yeah, sure, be a dickhead, fuck everyone. Um, so now Pride, like this past Pride that I went to, it felt really hollow. And I feel like it should be a fuck you more than a party. Mm-hmm. It needs to be more of a fuck you. We, like, we need to talk about what's going on instead of being like, oh my god, Margaret Cho is here fucking performing a, a, you know, her stand-up comedy. It's like, who gives a fuck? Like, love you, Margaret Cho. Honestly, you're hilarious. But, like, who gives a fuck about Margaret Cho? Like, why aren't we having rallies and riots and just being pissed off that our very existence mm-hmm. is being shit all over again or continuously? And people are making money on it now. Tons. Like, T-Mobile is my cell phone carrier, and I like they do have a presence in the, in the Pride Parade, and they are a pretty progressive company, even when I work for them. But, like, what do you do the other 364 days of the year? What do you fucking do? You don't throw money at... LGBT organizations. You only do it in Pride Month. You know what I'm saying? Like, absolutely, like you said with Absolute Vodka, everyone just slaps rainbows on everything. It's like when I went after fucking Lush because they pissed me off last yep. year. Remember on Twitter? I like. Well, yeah. Uh, granted, I'm sure a lot of people thought I was just like some Twitter bro, like being all like, ooh, you know, whatever. But I. Twi- uh, Lush had some campaign, like some Pride campaign thing, right? Um, for, like, trans people, saying, like, oh, we support trans people, blah, 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 blah. But they couldn't even offer you a fucking full-time position. Yeah, when I worked my ass off harder than their full-time staff there. Exactly. Like, it's fucking ludicrous. Yeah, and you actually, like, kind of liked that job. Like, you were like, I'm good at it, and you felt like mm-hmm. you could you could work your way up the ranks or whatever the case was. And... So I, I tweeted at Lush, and I was like, this is fucked up that you're capitalizing on trans people, but you mm-hmm. can't even hire trans people full-time and give them benefits and, and a livable wage. And then Lush came back at me like, oh, well, you know, please give us with an example of what we've done, probably just so they could hush everything up or whatever the case mm-hmm. was. It's just um, we're not calling – not enough of us are calling out these companies that are capitalizing off of us. They're making money off of our existence when did we allow that to happen and why (sighs) it's in my opinion it's part of like a larger effort to pacify the community like there's been that long old discussion that i'm sure we all hate hearing about cops and pride because anybody with half the fucking brain knows that cops shouldn't be in pride because they are the number one force for oppressing us and holding us down i had a really big realization last year about why cops are in pride and why it's such a big fucking deal for them there They're are not, some gay I, cops though there are yeah, gay cops that are but the they, they can be there not as fucking cops you know what i mean sure um, the thing I realized, though, they don't have cops in pride to protect us. They have cops in pride because they're afraid of us. They saw what happened with the Stonewall riots. They know exactly what we're capable of. And the thing that scares them most is in a society that lives off of conformity and do as we say, an entire group of people who are willing to put their lives on the line to be who they are scares the shit out of them because you can't control that. You can't just take all those people who are willing to face whatever adversity you throw at them and and quiet them up like that. So they put cops in pride not to protect us, but to protect themselves because they're afraid another riot's going to happen because they know that they treat us like animals and they don't want to have to deal with the repercussions of it, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And also, I don't know how it is with um, Canadian uh, pride celebrations, but we often have protesters show up at ours. Do mm-hmm. you guys have any protesters? Um, yeah, they're usually definitely. they're usually not huge groups. They're usually these little pockets of like assholes with signs. Now, granted, 
they're not the Westboro Baptist Church, but they're very similar to them. We have okay. them here in Philly specifically. They also show up to Philly Pagan Pride. Um, I mean, whatever. Uh, but the thing is that they show up and they stand just outside the 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 main area. They don't um, in, at Outfest. They're actually because Outfest happens in the neighborhood, so they block off certain blocks. And they're actually inside the neighborhood, like uh, spouting out their bullshit. Um, but with pride, they're like right outside the the festival area, or like right off to the side. And they're like, you know, God hates you, and you're a fag, and you know, like they do that whole thing. Um, but the cops are standing right there to protect them. To protect them, because they know. That if you get a bunch of, and I know that, like, I don't necessarily agree with the whole party aspect of, of Pride, and of course there's always booze and alcohol involved, but honestly, when you get a bunch of boozed up, fucking pissed off people, what do you think's going to happen? You know what I mean? Like, what do, you, what do you think? Like, even I have, like, had a couple of drinks, and I'm like, man, I just want to go fucking punch that guy right in his fucking face, you know? And if, if you have, like, 15 other people, 20 other people thinking the exact same thing, you know, it's... It, it gets it gets scary, but it's scary for a good reason because, like, I understand free speech and I understand that not everyone agrees with, and I hate saying this, not everyone agrees with gay people, not everyone agrees, but it's like saying like, I, I don't know, like, it's just weird that you don't agree that someone should exist. Yeah. I don't see how that's an argument. I don't see how that's that even has um, grounds for discourse of saying, like, I don't agree that you should exist. Yeah. What? What does that even mean? Does that mean you want to kill me so I don't exist? Is that what that means? You know it's what I mean? really what it comes down to, actually. They would love to see like us if they could, alive. Like, if they could push a button and just erase us, that's they probably... Won't. They would push that button. And mm-hmm. I just... but And you know what? From, 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 the, from another perspective, if I had a button to erase them, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could because I they're they're human. You know what I mean? Like I just I just don't think I could. I guess like you know um, like Thanos is like Infinity Gauntlet snap. I just don't know if I could do it. I I'm a little angrier honestly. Like I am so tired of those people, and they yeah. always use the same tired defense. They say, "Well, I have freedom of speech." Yes, you do. You have freedom of speech, which means that you're not getting arrested and sent to jail for saying those things. But so do I. And you having freedom of speech does not like keep you. Doesn't mean that you have freedom from repercussion. And everybody sure. else has right to tell you exactly what they think as well. And that's the problem with all these people. When you get mad at them for expressing their opinion, they'll say, well, it's freedom of speech. You're trying to fight me. But what they're literally doing is saying, I should have the freedom of speech to say whatever I want, and you should not have the grounds to contest me. Because right. they just they just want to dehumanize us, and they don't want to hear the counter argument. Because if freedom of speech didn't exist, they'd be arrested for that, and we'd be arrested for calling them out. We do have those freedoms, but you have to use them responsibly. Like if you, no one's sent to jail for being verbally racist, but you sure as fuck can lose your job over it because people don't have to abide what you're doing because they have their own freedoms as well. And it's like all those protesters just want to shove it in our faces that they think we shouldn't exist and then simultaneously tell us that we shouldn't oppose their views, you know? Yeah, and it's it's incredibly (laughs) messed up because we also... I guess I kind of want to talk a little bit about how I think pride should be. Um, mm-hmm. So there's two different types of prides that I attend. One being uh, gay pride, because that's generally what it's called, or queer pride. And the other being uh, like pagan pride events. I was just at one, yeah. Del Marva pagan pride. It was very nice. Um, generally, so here's the, here's the main difference between pagan pride events versus queer pride events. Okay. So, um, a queer pride event is it's a it's a it's a parade and a party. That's what it is. Uh, the parade they have the different the bars, businesses, clubs, whatever. Everyone shakes their ass and throws you colored beads, and they're like, "Ooh, I'm gay, awesome, great." And mm-hmm. then you go to a party area, and everyone drinks, and there's different booths and all kinds of rainbow swag and free condoms. That's my experience. Of, of gay pride events. That's what I've experienced. Um, would you say that yours are similar when you go to them? 
Yeah, there's also a lot of um, vendors who sell stuff. Yeah, um, vendors, yeah. And, like, I do appreciate being able to get some really gay pins and patches to, like, mm. work on my patch jacket. But it's very similar. You have, like, concert spaces. You have, like, the straight shutdown so people can walk in it. Um, <clears throat> you have a whole bunch of rainbow capitalism bullshit going on. And it's yeah. people get drunk and they try and hook up with each other sort of thing. And there's performances. And that's pride. You know? Yeah, and that's that's Pride in a nutshell. Now, the Pagan Pride events are a lot different. So usually they're centered in some sort of like main area. There's no parade. There's no, oh my God, hi, we're here, we're this, you know, we're witches. There's no, um, there's no advertisement of what it is. Yeah. Um, it's just a, it's a lot of vendors in like one particular space. There's a couple of rituals that happen during the day. There's workshops and talks. So some people give workshops about certain topics or whatever the case is or sometimes they have a keynote speaker sometimes there's a like a performance area um for different performances music whatever the case is um but most of all it's a very self-contained event that is open to the public because they're in public spaces so people can can wander in and out and, and learn and experience and be a part of it um but it's it feels what more what a pride event should be it's a it's a bunch of pagans together celebrating the fact that they are pagans. Mm-hmm. It's um it's the idea of like these are our people we take care of our own. Now I don't think that pagan pride necessarily has to be as like I would love it if if queer pride events were more I guess um, more protesty more militant not mm-hmm. mil- I guess militant is kind of the word I want to use like more angry. I feel like queer pride events should be more angry, but I do like the serenity that um, pagan pride events offer because I feel like that's how they should be. It's like a it's like a village bazaar. It's like a little like it's a lot of village witches coming together and existing and selling their wares and selling and trading their knowledge and, and everything like that. And so at at Philly Pagan Pride we have a group that the same people that come to queer pride um, they show up with their horns and their signs and they stand outside the park and the first year they tried to come into the park and I will never forget this moment because they came into the park like with their horns and their signs and they start walking it's a public park so they're allowed to so they're walking into the park and then all of a sudden like 20 to 30 people that were at the festival just started walking toward them until they and so they just backed out. Like, they didn't touch them. They didn't, no one threw anything. There was no violence. It was just, we're going to keep making this wall of people until you yep. leave because you're not welcome here. And they backed them right out up to the corner. And then they, you know, they, they did their whole, their whole spiel um, out there. But I will never forget that because you'll never see that at a queer pride event because there's yeah. cops there. The cops are already there. And the yep. cops already allow it to happen. We had to call police for the um, for the the pagan pride event. We had to call them and say, "Hey, um, you know, this is going on. We need these people removed." And then when they got there, they said, "Well, we can't remove them. They have free speech." So they just stood there until those people said all their hateful shit and left and protected them until they left. So really, it's the same thing that happens, but it was the idea that like. The cops are already at queer pride events. They're yep. not. They're already in place. Like that contingency plan is already there. It's like they're allowing it to happen. And mm-hmm. last year we really took care of them. We had these mylar reflective boards, and we had people. Uh, had our staff people just stand in front of the protesters, holding up the mylar reflective boards, reflecting so reflecting their own hate back at them. Who yeah. just stood there. And they say really, really hateful things, like, Mm -hmm. go kill yourself, and, you know, like, all these really triggering, terrible things, like, they say this, and these cops, they just allow it to happen, but I imagine, like, what if we, like, what if someone who identifies as a witch says, go jump off, go jump off a cliff, go jump off a cliff. You'll be arrested for hate speech. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing as if um, queer people showed up to protest a church, they would legally have us removed and arrested. For hate speech. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For hate speech. It's um, 
I don't like the, the, the double-edged sword. I don't, I don't like the, I, not the double-edged sword, the, sta- the double standard. I don't like the double standard. I don't like it at all. And the older I get, the more I realize that I don't, I don't like queer pride events because we've lost our way mm-hmm. as queer people. And no. even Sorry. the L's, the, the L's, the G's, and the B's, and mm-hmm. I know there is by erasure, but the L's, the G's, and the B's constantly ignore the T's. Constantly. Yeah. And it's not right. I almost feel like we almost need our own events. Mm-hmm. And I hate to say that because I love in- inclusive. Like, I love the idea of everyone being one. I mm-hmm. love the idea of everyone being together. But I just, I don't feel the love. Feel yeah. Love. And, like, inclusivity only happens when you're advocating for the most marginalized people in the group, right? Because it's if it's not 100% inclusive for everybody, it's exclusive for some people. And especially, like... Pride is ridiculously ableist. Like if you have uh, like a wheelchair or mobility access stuff, people don't care. They'll push you right out of the way to get whatever they want. It's not a welcoming space. Now, I will segue into saying that it also does vary city to city that you go to. Like yes. um, um, I've been to Pride in three different cities in Canada. I've been to Vancouver, Toronto, and Ottawa. Um, Vancouver mainstream pride is very much the same thing as Toronto's rainbow capitalism. Um, The nice thing is the trans march there is 100% unsanctioned. It's run by volunteers. There's no profits involved. There's nobody selling anything. It's by trans people, for trans people, and allies are welcome to come and march with us like my mother and my auntie did. Um, And that was good because it was made by trans people and it was our own space. It wasn't given to us. We had to take it for ourselves. Um, Ottawa actually had a fairly decent pride. It was the only pride I've actually been to where there was like a really good mixing between everything. And they even had like um, a pagan pride group march. Like uh, they had queer pagans marching in the pride saying queer pagan and proud, you know. And afterwards, it was literally just like... um, like you describe with Pagan Pride, it was low key in a park. There's a bunch of vendors. It's very chill, welcoming atmosphere. Some prides can be done very right, but it's like the bigger the city and the bigger the crowd that you get, the more likely it's gonna like have that bullshit to it, yeah. you know. And, and, um, and the city makes money off of it. Absolutely. Um, I've only been to one Pagan Pride event, but it was very similar to what you described. It was very serene. It was very calm. It was welcoming. Um, they had like seminars and stuff where you could like go and learn stuff in between. There was a bunch of vendors. Um, they had a cool activity here for like a scavenger hunt where like you had to go and do different stuff and like find different things in the Pagan Pride event, which would encourage people to talk to each other. And um, there was something set up with it so that you had to find somebody to do it with. So it encouraged people to make connections within the community and also like you kind of get away with shit at pagan pride that you can't in queer pride like there was the heathens standing there in armor with swords and shields and like if you had that you wouldn't be let within a fucking mile of queer pride because of the cost but but like because it's a smaller thing and it's less um it's less observed by society as a whole that kind of goes on there. And there were no protesters there. Protesters would be scared shitless of the heathen six feet tall guys in studded leather armor with a Viking war shield and a long sword. They wouldn't even exactly. like have the guts to say a single thing. So they're very different environments, you know? I almost feel like um, like queer pride is like a declawed cat. Yep. You know, it's like, it can still bite, but it takes a lot more effort. You have to get closer. You have, to, you, you have like, to get closer to get bitten by a declawed cat mm-hmm. versus, like, a cat who has its claws, it can reach out and swipe at you, which is how I feel like pig and pride events are. And and mm-hmm. you're more respectful of a cat with claws because you know you can get hurt more easily. Yeah. Like, I'll never forget last year when those protesters showed up, uh, Byron Ballard was our, was our keynote speaker, and someone saw her, like, do something like that, like spin her hand or something like that. She was doing active fucking witchcraft to get these people away. And you just don't see that at Queer Pride. You just have a bunch of drunk people with their rainbow beads like, fuck you, blah, blah. And it just doesn't hold as much power. It doesn't yeah. hold as much power. I would almost say that, like, we as queer witches, like, part of me, want to avo- part of me wants to just avoid 
queer pag- uh, queer pride events mm-hmm. because I just can't stand them. But then at the same time, I feel like I need to have a presence there and bring my magic there. Yeah. To fight off the things that I don't want in the community. It's difficult to belong to two communities, and I think that's it's kind of really why I wanted this podcast to to be such a thing is because it, it takes those two communities and makes them one. It makes because mm-hmm. they're it's it's very different being a queer witch rather than being like just like a cishet witch. It's just it's such a different experience, or even being queer but not but not a witch. I don't know. It's just it's a very distinct blend of of almost culture, and mm-hmm. it's a distinct blend of identity. And um, with Pride Month approaching, I guess I'm still on the fence about whether I... I almost feel like I'm becoming a little bit disenfranchised with the queer community. And I feel much more empowered by the witch community. Yeah. But I don't want to give up on the queer community either, because I know that there's still people there that need that need strong, uh, like, figures and role models there. Yeah. Plus, I feel like if we stop fighting for pride, then we've, we've lost the, the main space that we've carved out for ourselves. I feel like I go to pride almost as like a protest in and of itself to say, hey, I'm a trans woman, I exist, you can't fucking erase me, I'm not part of your rainbow capitalism bullshit, I'm not here to pay a bunch of money and get drunk and hook up with random people in bars, but I need to be visible there and share my voice so other people who feel the same don't feel like they're alone, you know? Yeah, I I would almost say, like, I would love... I think it would be interesting in, in Pride events to encourage our viewers, if you do have one other person maybe in your area or a little group of people, go to go to these Pride events as queer, as visible queer witches and, and you know, work magic there because mm-hmm. it's needed. It's, it's really, really needed at, at these places. And as a sort of, like, way to, to wind down and, and feel safe, go to Pagan Pride events <laughs> if they are in your area, um, because they are some of the most empowering things that you mm. could be a part of. They Absolutely. Really are. They're incredibly empowering. And they usually happen after the Queer Pride events. So they're usually, yeah. like, toward the end of the summer, leading into the fall. Um yeah, definitely, definitely try and attend those. Um, the mm-hmm. the difference between the two is amazing. It's amazing how different they are. Don't let queer pride events um, sort of shape your expectation of pagan pride events because they're completely different. Mm-hmm. They're completely different. Um, but yeah, just stay, stay, stick with your communities and, and bring your magic there because it's needed. And I feel like we've kind of lost our way. Yeah. Honestly, the only thing I don't like about Pagan Pride events is that I don't have enough money to buy all the really great <laughs> things there. There's, like, top-notch shit. Like, oh my gosh, really yeah. good patches. Like, the stickers I have on my phone right now are from Pagan Pride. Like, if I could, I would bring, like, $500 and just support the local community. And if you can do that, I encourage you to do it. Because, like, the people who go to Pagan Pride, they're not, like, <clears throat> big-time companies profiting. They're, like, <clears throat> small-time people like, you know, Jay and I running a podcast sort of thing and your support means the world to them and it like that's the thing so um, there nice. is no big companies there's no big companies at pagan pride events in fact we had one company like bath fitters or something like that try it and they paid for a booth and we refunded their money and said no we don't want you here you have no purpose of being here this yeah. is not your space good yeah. Yeah, and that's actually something now that you mention it, too. There was no corporate anything at Pagan Pride uh, out here in Toronto. Like, there was, like, handmade uh, books. And also, it's, like, really diverse. Like, a lot of people have this image of Pagan Pride just being, like, a bunch of white cis hat 
uh, Wiccan, Candles and tarot it's cards. not. You yeah. have people from all different faiths, all different practices from all over the world there. And it is really incredible to be a part of. Um, I would just regret that I was injured on the day of uh, Pagan Pride Toronto and I couldn't go because I 1000% want to go there ne- this upcoming year and like get to be a part of that community because like it was really welcoming and like when I was injured and I couldn't be there long like the people were like oh you sure you can't stay for a little bit you know and like actually tried to encourage me to feel comfortable in the space because they knew that I was new because it's a smaller community and it's much more close-knit and like they want you to be a part of it instead of just like oh whatever you're just another another person in the mass of millions of people here you know and it's it's a nice environment honestly. Yeah, and also for um, it's it's way more accessible for disabled folks mm-hmm. or you know diff- differently abled, I should say. So um, so if there's is someone like you know coming by with a wheelchair, people move. Yes. Or if they see someone like with a cane, you know people give them space. Mm-hmm. Or you know oh if you're if you're taking a while looking at someone's wares, someone won't just like move next to you too close or bump you out of the way, they'll maybe go to another table and look until you, you know, or they'll be like, oh, I'm really sorry, but I just really want to look at this thing. And they're just so much more fucking respectful. It's, <laughs> um, it's really true. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, and I, and I hate to, and I, and I don't want to, to pit one community against each other because the whole point of this is to bring them both together. But mm-hmm. I would love to see, more witch, uh, rep- more pagan and witch representation mm-hmm. at queer events because so many of us are queer. Yeah. I would love to see a full, like, just a coven just roll out <laughs> on, on, on a, on a gay pride event. That would, that would be so empowering. Or have a, having a ritual. You know what I'm saying? Like, what stops you from doing a ritual out? Like, you know where those protesters are? What stops yeah. you from having a ritual right there? Nothing. So. That's something I actually forgot to mention. The Vancouver Trans March was so cool that we actually did have a ritual gathering for pagans in there. And anybody who had their own thing to add to it was welcome to. So we did like the hail and welcome. We had everybody like stand in a circle and call out different stuff. And I called out like some of the DKMU beings that I work with, you know, and they just ran with it and it was great. And we all had like this little space where we did a ritual for protection to like drive off the, the shitty transphobes. Cause you even still get protesters over in Vancouver. Um, but that was lovely. And then um, at the Ottawa pagan pride, like I mentioned, they straight up had a section of the March they took for themselves. And it was queer pagans from uh, the Ravens Knoll community and the greater on uh, greater Ottawa area who showed up to make their presence known. And they were visibly a part of it. Like there was a, one guy wearing like a bear skin or something because like he does like uh bear magic to do with like nordic stuff and it was just so cool to actually see us have a place in a pride event you know mm-hmm. so i think that's um i think that's kind of like i'm, I'm glad we have the same kind of takeaway of this yeah i, I kind of wish i, I, I would kind of i definitely wish scott was here to definitely get his input on it because i'm not really sure where he stands with pride events yeah um, I think it's similar to what we were saying, but I'm not sure. Um, but I think I like that, like, our takeaway is kind of the same, is that, you know, we kind of feel a little bit disenfranchised with the, the queer community and gay pride events, but not disenfranchised to the point where we're, where we're like, leaving those communities. Um, we're still mm-hmm. very much a part of them, but I would love to, with pride coming, I would love to inject some 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 power into it like i we need the empowerment part back and not just the party yeah party yeah okay throw a party but why are you throwing a party you know it's it's like when you do a ritual it's like you can have your your feast after because whenever we do like a ritual we have like a nice dinner afterwards Mm -hmm. um so yes feast and and party quote unquote but do the work first. Like, do the work. Lay lay those grounds of empowerment. Say what you need to say. You know, throw out your middle fingers and say, fuck, fuck you. You know, like, I exist. Um, go out there into these, into these events and be visible as a queer witch because it is incredibly, incredibly important. 
and you will empower other closeted queer witches that are out there and they and you will come together and you will form very strong bonds and you will empower both of the communities that you are in oh yes yeah. that's, that's kind of my takeaway with with pride is connect and find others like you because that's the only way we're going to survive yeah to quote rage against the machine you got to take the power back exactly exactly um so i think uh we can wrap up this yeah. episode on pride um, feels like a good note to end on yeah definitely so be kind to each other be compassionate and also fuck the patriarchy <laughs> fuck the patriarchy <laughs> um yeah so uh our uh zine our first issue of our zine is up on patreon we released that with the new moon cycle um, we probably missed the new moon it feels like We've i don't think so, so. I don't think we did, no, because it came out on the... the Start of the month. Yeah, start of the month. Let's see. Let's go back. I think we're fine. Yeah. So it's the start of the month, and the next new moon is June 3rd. June 3rd. Perfect. I will have material ready for it by then. Yeah, so we're coming up on the new moon, so make sure we're, we're coming up on issue number two. Um, the way you access the zine is the $1 uh, tier on Patreon. I have to look at the Patreon again, because Patreon just enrolled a bunch of new changes, and I want to make sure that <laughs> tiers still exist. They just mm-hmm. did a bunch of new changes. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's the thing. If you, if you are interested in that, um, we are working on some extra bonus content, things like that. Uh, we're going to work on getting out like a schedule of the seasons and when to expect episodes. Um, we're just trying to block it out and plan that out in a, in a logical way mm-hmm. that helps with everyone. Um, and of course, we're on all the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. We're on them all. We've been a little bit quiet on social media just because we've had a lot going on. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, Sophia is stressed to the max. I'm stressed to the max. And Scott is so stressed, he couldn't even record today. So <laughs> that's where we're at. Um, but yeah, so just just stick with us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. It's it's a, it's a topic that really means a lot to, to us to really talk about. And every year we're probably going to say something about Pride. And we're just going to throw our opinions out there because it's incredibly important. So um, I think that about wraps everything up. Yeah. See you all in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Hello, everyone. Scott here. I've been reading tarot for over 10 years. I am an intuitive reader, and through my readings, I try to give guidance to aid my clients in navigating their lives. To schedule a reading with me, you can find me on Facebook at Witchwise Seer and Witch. You can also find me over on Instagram and Tumblr with the handle Witchwise, spelled W-Y-T-C-H-W-Y-S-E. You can find links to all of my social media in the show notes. I hope to hear from you. I'm ready when you are, my friend. Do you have to hold your phone up the whole time, or do you have a yep. prop? No, I don't have anything to hold this bitch with.